Hello everybody, this is Ms. Peachy from your WCA biology class and we are looking at unit 5 lesson 12 bacterial classification and protists today. This is actually a re-recording. I had recorded this one earlier and I feel like it wasn't um, complete enough so I wanted, I wanted to make sure that I made you a very complete video recording. So if you saw the, the earlier one, hopefully this one's a little bit better. Um, this goes into a lot of detail on how we classify bacteria specifically. It also talks about protists kind of towards the end of the lesson, but the majority of the lesson is on bacterial classification and how we determine kind of the identity of bacteria. So um, just to kind of go into some of the highlights, I guess, of this is that bacteria can be classified in multiple different ways. There are some that are kind of more like tried and true tested methods that we've been doing for a very long time and some that are a bit more um, updated, I guess, or newer based on kind of newer technologies and DNA sequencing and things like that that we can do today that we weren't able to do years and years ago. Um, weren't able to do when Miss PG was in college, basically, because I'm old, apparently. But one of these ways, it's more of a, an, an older method, still being used today, obviously, is through something called morphology. Morphology is just the study of shape of an organism. You see morphology in all sorts of branches of science. So bacterial morphology studies the shape of bacteria. Um, you could look at geomorphology, which studies the shape of landforms and stuff like that. So morph morphology in general is just referring to the shape of something. So bacteria are sorted into four main categories. We have um, the spherical shaped bacteria, which are called cocci, rod shaped, which we call bacilli, um, spiral forms, which are called spirillium or spirillia, and we have those that are lacking a specific shape, which we call pleomorphs. They don't really have a designated shape. Then they have subcategories. Yeah, of course they have subcategories, right? So our cocci can be broken down into, they might be individual. You could have long chains, which we call streptococci, two diplococci, um, sar. I don't know if it's sarcina or sarcina, I don't know how to pronounce that one, which comes in clusters like this, or tetrads, or groups, which we call staphylococci. So multiple different configurations, but again, the individual cells are still spherical in shape because these can actually be in groups with each other. They can form colonies and stuff like that. We also have our rod-shaped bacteria, which we call bacilli. These are very familiar to us. Um, Lactobacillus, for example, um, Bulgaria, Bulgaricus is useful in cheese and yogurt making. And I certainly like both cheese and yogurt. Big fan of dairy. It's not quite a big fan of me, though, people. But um, I digress. So then they talk about, you know, other types of shapes. We have those pleomorphs that can be different. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not quite to pleomorphs yet. We're talking about our rod shapes still. They're giving up some examples of those. Um, spiral shape, those spirillia, talks about different examples of spirillia. Um, and you can read about those as well. And it also mentions, you know, other ways in which we can categorize bacteria. And for example, this particular shape, um, Vibrios bacteria are a curved rod shape. They're a comma type shape. And these require a high salt environment. So we can look at, you know, the type of environment that bacteria live in that helps us with their classification as well. And we can also look at things like how they use oxygen and stuff like that, which help us with their classification. So again, talking about spiral shaped bacteria here and different examples of those, and then irregular shaped bacteria and different examples of those, those are those pleomorphs. Um, so it kind of gives some examples of those as well. But ultimately what you kind of come away with from this discussion is that there's a multitude of different shapes, subshapes, um, exceptions and things like that. And we try to group these organisms into different categories. That's called classification. Biology is built upon classifying organisms into different categories. But I also want you to walk away with this concept here, 
that the idea of classifying biological organisms into groups is a human construct. And that means it's something we like to do to make sense of the natural world. Um, and it helps, it helps us to kind of make sense of what we're looking at. If we have a bacteria, if we have certain categories that bacteria can belong to, it will help us to identify that bacteria if it's not known right away, right? So it's useful to us as humans as well. However, it is not perfect. It is far from perfect and some bacteria do not fit neatly into any of the groups that we make. And so there's always these outliers that, that have difficulty conforming to those, those groups that we've kind of made right? So just kind of keep that in mind when it comes to any living things in classification. And I, I will be saying this again and again and again this year, the classification is something that we impose upon nature. It is not something that exists naturally. So we will not always fit perfectly into any one group that we have made. All right. So um, moving on, it talks about how we classify. And that's kind of where this next section, I guess, comes into play. We can classify them based on whether they are gram positive or gram negative. We can classify them based on how they use oxygen. They can be aerobic, meaning that they need oxygen. They can be anaerobes, which means they don't need oxygen. They can be facultative anaerobes, which means they kind of need oxygen. They can actually do either or, really. It means that they can use oxygen if it's there, and if it's not, they can deal without it as well. They can be autotrophic or heterotrophic, meaning they can make their own food like, like plants do, or they have to consume other bacteria to be able to get their nutritional needs required. In fact, we have photoautotrophic bacteria and chemoautotrophic bacteria, so bacteria that use the sun to make their own food, but also bacteria that use um, different chemicals to make their own food. These bacteria are often found in areas without sunlight, like the depths of the ocean, near hydrothermal vents, and stuff like that. They can be distinguished as either being modal or non-modal, meaning they can move on their own or they can't, right? They either have, they can swim because they have a, a flagella or they have cilia that helps them to kind of move around, or um, they can't do that. And they can be pathogenic or non-pathogenic. So pathogenic, um, Pathogenic means that they can infect humans and cause disease in humans, or they can be non-pathogenic, meaning they don't cause disease in humans. And, and I should be very careful here because there are pathogens to things that are not humans as well, right? So there are certain bacteria that are pathogenic to dogs that are not pathogenic to humans. So specifically, we are looking at whether they are pathogens of humans, but um, bacteria, you know, there's, there's a multitude of them and some that are pathogenic to other organisms are non-pathogenic to humans. And then most recently, bacteria are categorized as being sh um, by shared RNA. So we can, we can sequence their genome and we can look at um, that sequence and we can determine whether they're related to each other based upon the similarities that they have in their genetic code, which is much more precise, I would say, than some of these other methods. All right, so then it talks a bit about a type of test that they can do called a gram test or gram stain. Um, a gram stain uses, it's a fairly complex process, which we're going to actually go through in live lesson. Um, it's actually kind of fun to do as well. I've done many of these when I was in college and some of them when I used to teach in the bricks and mortar biology classroom as well. But basically it takes advantage of differences in the cell walls of bacteria. That there are basic two different structures of the cell wall that leads to differences in how that bacteria takes in this particular stain. So in a gram negative bacteria, gram negative bacteria will have a thinner cell wall and they actually have, let's see, um, like a, a protective layer 
It's often a lipid layer, doesn't always there, but protects them against a moisture exchange. So when you apply these different stains to them, they do not absorb and keep as much of the stain. So when you do this process, they once you're done, they appear to be redder in color. Because there's actually two stains that you apply um, when you do the gram staining process. And the first stain is a red colored stain and the second stain is a very dark violet colored stain. The gram negative bacteria will, will show up when you're done as being more red in color. Gram positive bacteria have thicker cell walls made of peptidoglycan um, with an outer lip, without the outer lipid layer. So they don't have that protective layer. And because the cell wall is so thick and it doesn't have that protection, it's like a sponge and it just sucks up and absorbs that violet stain, that crystal violet dye. And so that makes it a very vibrant purple color. And we call those guys gram positive. The interesting thing here is that gram positive bacteria are generally more susceptible to antibiotics and antibacterial agents. So because their cell wall absorbs the stain so well, not I shouldn't say because it absorbs the stain, but it absorbs other things too. Like if you apply an antibiotic to it, it will absorb that and that will have a better chance of killing that bacteria than gram negative bacteria because their cell wall does not, um, it's not as thick, but it also has that protective lipid layer, which keeps it from absorbing um, the antibiotics and stuff like that too. So that's also interesting. So if you have a pathogen that is a gram positive bacteria, it's easier to treat than if you have a pathogen that is a gram negative bacteria. Um, let's see. So it talks about how identifying bacteria has to be a polyphasic approach. And that means that no one technique, no one um, characteristic is enough to identify a bacteria. You have to have multiple different clues, multiple different techniques and um, observations to be able to correctly identify a bacteria. So one way was gram staining, which we talked about. And gram staining is nice because it tells us about the bacteria's cell wall composition. It also stains the bacteria a bright color so it's much easier to see under a microscope and it allows us to determine the morphology or the shape of the bacteria much better, right? So that's why bat gram staining is, is a great technique to be able to do. Um, other tests that they can do is how the bacteria uses oxygen. So another type of a test is they actually use this broth. It's, it's, they, they call it theo glycolate broth here. I don't, I don't know that word very well. Um, we always called it nutrient broth. It's just a broth that allows, it's full of nutrients that bacteria like to eat and it allows them to grow. And they put this um, broth in an autoclave and they actually take oxygen out of the air in there. And um, as it sits the oxygen begins to return to the broth, collecting first at the top of the solution and diffusing downward. And so basically what happens is when you're done is that the bacteria, if they need oxygen to grow, they're gonna all migrate to the top of the test tube to be able to try to get as close as possible to the oxygen, which is only on the top of the test tube. Because they basically drive all the oxygen out of the nutrient broth. And then they reintroduce it so it's just at the top. Okay, and then the bacteria, if they're aerobic bacteria, they all swim to the top, so they collect at the top of the tube. Then you know those bacteria are aerobic bacteria. If the bacteria are settled to the bottom, then they're anaerobes. They don't need oxygen to um, survive. And if they're kind of spread throughout, they might be faculative anaerobes, they maybe can do either or. So it kind of gives you an idea of the requirement of oxygen. Another way in which they can test bacteria is to grow them in on a petri dish, in like this jelly-like substance, which is called agar, right? And in the agar, can be made of different things. So you have, sometimes you have something called nutrient agar, which is much like the broth in that it's kind of like just 
has nutrients in it that helps bacteria to grow. Um, you can have blood agar. There are certain bacteria that need to have the, the um, ingredients found in blood agar to be able to grow. There's sulfur-rich agar. So just the composition of the agar itself can tell us something about the bacteria. If bacteria grow better in one type of agar than another, it helps us to identify that particular kind of bacteria. Um, it also talks a little bit about, let's see here, endospores. So some bacteria will, will form things called endospores. And these are like dormant spores that allow the bacteria to survive when environmental conditions are not favorable for them to survive. So they're basically going to go dormant and then they'll wake up later when environmental conditions return to a better state for them. And not all bacteria can form these spores and the conditions under which they form the spores vary too. So by replicating, simulating some of those conditions in lab, you can determine whether the bacteria will or will not form endospores. And then finally they can, oh, there's two other things. They can test um, their, like how susceptible they are to specific antibiotics. They can actually, I think I have this in my PowerPoint here. Hang on, where is my PowerPoint? Um, give me one second. I just want to open this back up that I just closed a minute ago. But they have these, um, right here. They can actually take little tiny discs, and on the discs, they put antibiotics. On the plate, all this like light yellow stuff is bacteria. If the bacteria are susceptible to the antibiotic, there will be a little zone around the disc that is completely empty of bacteria. So all the bacteria here died because that bacteria um, were susceptible to the antibiotic in the disc. So these, this disc basically poisoned and killed all the bacteria that were within range of it. So we know that this antibiotic is super effective. This one is less effective. See, because the, the zone here is smaller. And these antibiotics are not effective at all. I'm not sure why this one is yellow in color like that, if that's, if that's just the color of the, I'm guessing this is just like iodine or something, so it's also highly effective. So the antibiotic itself might be tinting the agar here. But this is, this is a Petri plate with agar on it. Um, this is an example of the different kinds of agar and how well the bacteria grows on those plates. So these are all tests that they can do to determine the identity of the bacteria. And then finally, they can actually just sequence the RNA of the bacteria and they can like look at that genome and compare it to other bacteria to see how close they are to each other. That helps us to categorize things a little better and kind of see how they're related to each other. So that's bacteria. Um, the next section talks about another type of an organism called a protist. A protist is also well, I shouldn't say that. A protist can be a single-celled organism as well. Remember, bacteria are single-celled prokaryotic organisms. They have simple, they don't have any organelles in there. They just have DNA, they have ribosomes, cytoplasm, and cell walls, and they're very, very small. Protists are eukaryotic organisms. They've got the full gamut of different organelles inside of them. Um, but they're weird. Like, this is what I mean, everybody, when I say the classification is a human construct. Because protists are the misfits, the junk drawer, if you will, of biology. They don't fit into any other category. They don't fit into bacteria because they're eukaryotes. They don't fit into plants because many of them are single-celled. They don't fit into fungi because, again, many are single-celled. Um, so we made a new category. We'll call it Kingdom Protista, and we'll put everything else in there that does not fit. The problem is that protists themselves aren't really well related to each other. So it's a poorly constructed group. It's a group of miscellaneous, but every, if you take two protists from the group, they may not be related to each other even closely at all. So it's just not a well constructed classification group. Um, there are protists that are plant-like, there are protists that are animal-like, and there are protists that are like fungi, in that some protists do photosynthesis like plants, and so they have plant-like categories. Some protists are um, 
heterotrophs like animals and that kind of stuff. Some of them have like different structures that are like fungus, but they're not actually fungi. And so that's why we put them into this kind of miscellaneous category. Um, they don't necessarily fit well together, but they don't fit anywhere else. Okay, that's pretty much what we're looking at. As far as morphology, <clears throat> again, we look at and we categorize them by three main categories, animal-like, plant-like, and fungi-like protists. Animal-like protists are still described using the old name protozoa. Um, they're modal, so they move around. They can um, they eat other things, so they're heterotrophs. Plant-like protists contain chlorophyll. Some of them are non-modal, but some of them are modal, so that's not necessarily true. Um, euglena, for example, are modal. Um, but certain things like algae, for example, fit in Kingdom Protista. They're all very much plant-like, but they don't have all the same characteristics as plants. Fungi-like protists include slime and water molds. These are heterotrophs. These are often absorbative heterotrophs which means that rather than just like eating and engulfing food, they um, secrete enzymes that digest the food outside their bodies and then they absorb the nutrients through their bodies. So right now, you and I, we just eat our food and our body, all the digestion takes place inside. Absorbative heterotrophs digestion takes place outside. They digest the food and then suck up the nutrients. So that's kind of weird, but anyways, that's that's, protists really we didn't spend a ton of time talking about them they're really cool so i wish we would spend more time talking about them but um but the lesson really does go through and talk more about bacteria than the protists um talks a little bit about the process of endocytosis here which is kind of what i was talking about as well um, so endocytosis, we have discussed before when we looked at the endosymbiotic theory, right? So the idea of endocytosis is that the cell um, will take stuff into the cell by actually taking its cell membrane and wrapping around the thing that it wants to bring into the cell and then reforming the whole cell membrane around that object. So let's say this is your cell, right? And um, I don't know. This is the object I want to take into the cell. Probably a bad idea because it's so big. Like that. So when I want to take this into my cell, I just form my cell membrane around the object, and then the cell membrane down here is going to dissolve, and I was able to take that into my cell. So that's called endocytosis. Um, so that's pretty much it for this lesson, ladies and gentlemen. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, hopefully I'll see you in class to talk more about this, and I will see you guys in the next one.